Garrick has been nibbling on Delavian chocolates all morning long. The boy who cried wolf takes on a whole new meaning. And Odo goes on a date with a Flaxian in which they, you know, smell perfumes, discuss their favorites and stuff. Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Huss. Today we are reviewing Season 3, Episode 20 of Deep Space Nine called Improbable Cause, directed by... Mr. Avery Bro. Yeah. yeah. I like the pause that you good. gave uh, when I gave that last trivial. You're like, is he just going to tell a story now? <laughs> <laughs> How are you today, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing awesome. good. Yeah. Uh, before we uh, get too deep into this, please remember the easiest way to, and the cheapest and freest way to support this podcast is just click, click su subscribe. Click the, the bell icon. Give us a comment. Give us a share. Uh, give us a thumbs up. That stuff helps so much. It's totally free. We get it. You don't have a lot of money. It's tough right now. And there's stuff going on in the world outside in the, in the whole quadrant. If you do have money, go ahead and send us a dollar or two to patreon.com slash the seventh rule. If you don't, but you just want to say keep up the good work, guys, please subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications. And with that, let's talk about Star Trek instead <laughs> what do you think did you like this one i did like this one we do like yeah. our garrick stuff don't we i love my garrick stuff <laughs> he's so he's so clever and you know one of the things that stood out to me was the the language the wordplay there was a lot of really right. good writing Right, which is what I was going to say, I forgot to mention, written by Rene Echevarria. He deserves big kudos because I think we're going to be talking about all these masterfully written and delivered lines in this episode. I think that's the highlight for me. Um, mm -hmm. And it's great because you have the actors that are able to get the, the dialogue out with the same, with the emphasis that's necessary. It's really Shakespearean, which is interesting how they start the entire thing on this Shakespeare, right? Mm -hmm. And Garrett kind of making a, uh, you know, a estimation about Shakespeare being predictable. That's right. That's a good point. I hadn't really considered that they they might have been choosing Julius Caesar, you know, paying the homage to Julius Caesar in the opening scene because this episode was very Shakespearean. That's a good point. Yeah, I, f I felt that because, you know, Shakespeare is so immersed in the language and, and, and the body of work is in the dialogue, it's in the language, and I felt like this is the same thing. So I, I really want to give a shout out to Rene Echeverria for uh, masterfully crafting this, the language in this. And with Garrick in particular, it's, it's very, at least for in my estimation, it's difficult to conceive the lies in the way that he conceives these lies and have to cover them up, but make them feel truthful at the same time. It's, it's really a delicate uh, a balance that he, that he does when, he, when he's delivering these scenes. Right, and they always, I, I've noticed they, they love to open up the opening scene with something that really has nothing to do with the actual episode, but it's more like trivia. It's more like setting the table before you know what's for dinner, you know? It's just kind of like, yeah you know, Dax and Cisco are playing chess or Julian and Miles are playing darts or something. You know, it's just kind of like puts us in the life and and then we get all this trivia. Or Kira is telling, you know, Odo, you know, the, the Diluvians are going to be flying in their shipment on the whatever. <laughs> He's like, oh, they always like to fly in on the whatever, you know. <laughs> and, and you just get a little slice of life and then explosion happens or a ship appears or something like that. And this time it was... Julius Caesar, which was really cool. Uh, with the, do you remember Julius Caesar at all? Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to praise Caesar. Wait, no, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. I've already messed it up. It's this long, what is it Antony's oration? It's a long, really cool uh, monologue. Basically, he sounds like a, a lawyer, you know, and he goes into this whole long thing. It, it's actually, I hadn't thought of it till you mentioned, but it's actually a really good choice for this script. Um, and then they start talking about Garrick telling a doctor 
you're going to get indigestion, <laughs> which I thought that yeah. was funny. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Yeah. Garrett giving you medical advice. Um, <clears throat> also, shout out to the wardrobe in this particular episode because Garrick has some really fancy designs. Yes, he's, there it is. He's styling. Yeah, he's, I mean, the whole thing, is, and he has multiple wardrobe changes, so he's not just rocking one outfit the whole time. He switches it up, and it's, it's, it's a good look on him. You know, there was a point where I think, was it, was it Tane or was it the, the Romulan? First of all, the Romulan calling Garrick a cobbler was just freaking hilarious. I don't know why, but that crack. He's a cobbler, right? Whatever. Yeah, uh, I wrote that down. It was hilarious. Mr. Yeah. Garrick, a cobbler, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember if it was the Romulan or if it was Tane, but somebody said, Are, is this one of, your, one of the outfits you have made or put together? Is this one of your works? And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, that's so rude to say. And I looked, I was like, Actually, no, that's a really cool outfit. Like, yeah. He should claim yeah. that. That's pretty badass. Yeah. Like, and, I, and this is, if I remember correctly, this is the outfit that Garrick wears in his official action figure. So for those of you that are listening in, please comment and confirm this. But if I remember correctly, this is an iconic outfit because the official you know, Star Trek action figures, this is the outfit he's wearing. Interesting. That's a good one. It's a fun one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I had a question about this um, Tane character. Is he somebody we've seen before? Yeah, Taint. Um, no, no, no. Tane, Tane. Oh, t there's no T <laughs> at the end? Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, right. Uh, what's his first name? Uh, Perinium Taint. No, it's Enabrin Tane, Enabrin no. Tane. Um, he, yeah, we saw him maybe five to ten episodes ago, and it was think, really, yeah. it was really a wasted thing where it was when I think it was when Garrick was dying, and he says all of them were true, especially the lies kind of line, you know, which was awesome. I think it was called The Wire. It was either that one or another, or one in between that and now, and Tane just shows up yeah i think it was the wire tane just shows up in the last five or ten minutes pops into deep space nine saying oh yeah it's because of this or because of that and then he disappears and it was pretty it kind of felt contrived it felt like they could have done something better with that character but that's who he was um yeah i think that's the only other time that we've seen him so far yeah i he definitely looked familiar and i said i know i've seen this guy before i just didn't see him in the context or in the relationship capacity that he had in this episode. So it seemed, uh, it seemed yeah. unusual. And he was only in like one or two scenes last time. And it was not, it was not perfect. I thought, but this was a good real intro for him. And we're sure to see him more in the next episode. Yeah. What I really liked about this episode was the interaction between Garrick and Odo, yeah, I thought the two of them really danced well with the, you know, verbal jousting back and forth, you know, trying to analyze the other's psyche, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you're right. Uh, we've seen a lot of Julian and O'Brien. We've seen a lot of Julian and Garrick. We've seen a lot of Odo and Quark. But we haven't seen Odo and Garrick. You know, and that was, and it, and it was really interesting because we do get that sense when they start kind of sparring a little bit. We go, oh, we haven't really seen this this tennis match yet, you know. <laughs> and it was it was fantastic. I mean, the two of them are just the best. I mean, they're as good as it gets at what they do. And you know, and and again, the dialogue. I mean, you know, there was the line where Odo says, "Congratulations, your power of deductions are truly astonishing." Yeah, I wrote that <laughs> down too. Yeah. And it was just so sarcastic and just uh, <laughs> such a blow, you know. And 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 of course, uh, Garrick takes it in stride, you know, and and he has his own clever stuff to say in response. <laughs> um, and then and then Odo responds to that and says i'm not interested in debating your uselessness to me <laughs> right which is which is too bad because 
uh, Garrick is a master debater. Yeah, yeah, he is master. He's very good. Uh, at it. <laughs> he's very good at it. Yes. <laughs> But no, I thought it was. I thought that was the the meat of the of the the episode. That was what made it just really great. It was the back and forth between the two of them. Each kind of it was Garrick keeping his secret and Odo prying the door open into that world into the secret. And then obviously, what we're really getting here is the beginning of the Dominion War. We're seeing the I know, you know the so scene cool. starting to grow. We're seeing what's happening. And I think that's also something that's interesting for me is saying, okay, what is it about to unfold here? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a great, great thing to bring up. I actually hadn't really focused too much on that, but you're right. Because this is, it feels like this is where Deep Space Nine starts to take a turn. Because this is the first large scale storyline. This is, you know, the Federation meets the Cardassian Obsidian Order and the Romulan Tal Shiar and it's going to mix in with the Dominion and the Founders. I mean, this is the first episode of, you know, as the as the, the galaxy turns or whatever, you know, like it's like a whole, it's not just, you know, the Defiant going to the Gamma Quadrant. It, it or the you know deep space nine versus the romulans or klingons it's the whole neighborhood going into the gamma quadrant basically so it's really the, the first nugget that starts yeah. the avalanche yeah and we're seeing we're seeing you know what our equivalent of a world war starting to manifest this is more of like an intergalactic war with you know all these different sides on uh, involved. So I, I like seeing the culminations of how this is becoming. It's great how they're tying Garrick's <laughs> past uh, with the Obsidian Order, which obviously now that, you know, fast forward is going to become relevant in future Star Trek and, and, and you know, what we're seeing now with Picard, um, as well as the Tal Shiar, another element that's, you know, going to become more relevant as Star Trek continues to um, air episodes. But um, I think that we're seeing the real roots of these kinds of things. I, I love digging into the minutia of it. I like totally. seeing the past, the past history of what Garrick's about. Uh, you know, the cobbler slash tailor slash spy. <laughs> and I just really love the language. I, um, I thought the language was great. And there were a few director things that I actually pointed out too that I thought were little touches that I believe Avery, um, added to the mix really uh i want to hear about that right now but before we do that i do want to just say just to finish up what you're saying um it'll be interesting in a few episodes or a few seasons to look back at this point and say what would have happened how would this have been different had this meeting between in Abrantain and the Tal Shiar not, not happened. Like how did this, you know, that, how did that pebble make that avalanche happen? And what would have been, would that avalanche have happened if not for that pebble, you know? But what did you yeah, notice? That's a, Sorry. You no, know, that's an interesting thing. I like, I like the, the way you're thinking there. And, you know, that's, <clears throat> that's really a crucial, this is, that's why I think this is a crucial moment. We're seeing something that's like, and it completely kind of haphazardly happens, right? So it, it doesn't really, it, the way the story unveils and, and kind of reveals itself is, is really this haphazard. Somebody's trying to kill Garrick and then it's like way bigger than Garrick than an assassination attempt on Garrick. What's right. going on, right? Right. At first it just seemed like it's a, it's a whodunit, you know? And it's Odo is going to grumble his way to figure it out. Right. And so I, I really... I like the way that they kind of, you know, the expose of how it's how it's being exposed, how it's unraveling in front of our face. And also the very close ties between what Garrick and his past, as well as Odo's past and his connection to the founders. And you could see he had an emotional attachment to hearing about the founders being the focal of attack. So 
you know, those were the, all at play for me. Um, but going back to what, what I said earlier about uh, Avery and the directing, right. there were a few things that I, th I thought stood out um, to me, and I believe that there are choices that were made uh, by Avery in, in, in where he wanted to place the camera and, and why. Um, one of the things was the meeting um, where in, Oda was interrogating the merchant with the perfumes. Yeah, well, well, he was a what was he? Yeah, a, a flaxian. He was a flaxseed. He was a flaxseedian. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so he was. I liked that scene for number oh, one. Yeah. It oh yeah. Oh, it's very it was, smart. It was such a clever thing, and actually, I wrote down here. Odo's faces were hilarious to me. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> he, they were hilarious because he would yeah. he would smell something, and he's like, "And what is this?" Did you say, and he say, "Oh, that's spicy, spicy." Mm. It was just <laughs> it was uh, uh, it was it was Columbo ish. I was you know? just gonna like, say this was Columbo right here. You know, he was harnessing his inner Columbo chi. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and the interest he was taking in the smells and the scents and like, oh, that's interesting. The, the way he was doing it was so, so clever, I thought, you know, and, and, and it, was, it was just a joy to watch. It was playful, it was clever, and it was also getting to the root of what he was trying to get to. So it was all of those things were wrapped in one. But the beginning of that shot was started with a camera sweep over the table, uh -huh. which, which was lit you know and not not all the tables have this kind of a lighting to it but this particular table had a, a lighting underneath the surface of it and the camera was kind of sliding over the table as it was approaching the two of them and this box on the table so just a small thing but i know that's how Avery wanted to push into that into that scene was that was that at the very beginning is that what established the scene at the very beginning right that's, yeah yeah that that's was, something that directors and i bet you when avery thought of that he was like oh this is gonna be awesome this is gonna look so cool <laughs> yeah. yeah and and he probably saw the table and said wow this table you know has, is great it looks beautiful it's, it's mm -hmm. lit you know kudos and, to the art department a, the art department and the set designers that are coming mm -hmm. up with that stuff um you know and avery said hey let's make this a focal point this is awesome let's use the space that we have around us and you know, come in on this this particular interrogation scene, starting it with this rolling shot towards the two of them. So I thought that was great. Um, just a small little touch, but it just adds to the the confinement of the space and the setting up of the scene. Um, and there were also other directorial choices that I believe Avery took in the in this episode. For example, when Odo goes to visit his Cardassian friend in the cave, you know, somebody that owes him right. a favor. You know what that character name was on IMDb? Caveman. Informant. Caveman. Informant. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been better. Yeah, just informant. <laughs> so this poor guy gets up at three in the morning to put all this makeup on, memorizing all these beautiful tit-for-tat Shakespearean lines, stands up looking ominously, get some close-ups of his eyes, looking to all this stuff, and the character name is Informant. I'm like, oh, yeah. come on, give, give him a cool Cardassian name, man. Call him, call him like yeah. Alec or something, you know? Give him something cool. Yeah, something cool. I, I have to agree with that. And I've been in that same situation myself as an actor where right. I play, you know, skateboarder number three, and it's just... <laughs> it's embarrassing, man. It looks it's a little. It looks bad. On, yeah, I, I had the same thing with uh, was it the young and the restless? I was some SEC agent that was doing you know these things and and talking with this guy and handing him like I don't I barely remember. It was a few years ago, and my character name was SEC agent. I'm like okay, I mean. If, I, that really could, yeah. as far as your your uh, IMDb or your resume is concerned, that could be a background role. You know, that could be like, we have yeah. 20, 20 SEC agents run in. You're all two SEC agents. Okay, cool. You know, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, also you tell your friends. I mean, the first 
Uh, I got a, yeah, the first time I got a chance to be in a movie was the movie Beethoven, which was about that dog. Yeah, no way. Yeah, so that was my motion picture debut. It was an Ivan Reitman film. It was a big deal. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, you got the job, you know. And I'm actually one of the first kids that sees Beethoven in the beginning of the movie when he's in the, the window of the doggy store. And uh, it was me and a couple of other kids, and they just had me a skateboarder number two or three, you know. <laughs> and so... So I go to the premiere and, you know, all my friends are like, oh, you're in this movie. And uh, they're like, well, what character do you play? And I'm like, uh, I'm a skateboarder. Yeah, what's your character's name? You know, skateboarder number number three. And, <laughs> it, comes, <laughs> and it comes that way in the titles, you know, when, oh. the, when the credits are rolling. So you're like, it's a, it's a little bit of a dis disservice. I'm sure they can come up with a better way to get that done, you know at least for the confidence of the actor who's playing the role. I'll tell you one thing. As somebody that came up the ranks from the very bottom of the bottom myself, I, as a producer, I never give people those kinds of character names. Um, like when we did Renegades and we had a lot of, you know, background, a lot of featured people playing various aliens throughout the bar and doing all these things and you know really giving their hearts out to this because it's hot it's summer they're wearing masks they're wearing makeup they're you know and i and in on their releases on their actor releases i said if you have a character name that you want go right ahead so people got as creative as they want because they were these unknown alien races so they could pick anything mm -hmm. they could say i'm glabdor or i'm i'm the red knight of kilodram or you know go who know because who's going to say they're not you know so that way people got real character names that reflected the amount of work and effort that they put in and i encourage anybody that produces anything or direct is, directs anything to do the same even ad's can do that you know because a lot of times directors are too busy thinking about it but sometimes an ad or a second ad can just be like hey can you know we give these guys a character name and nobody's going to say no they're always going to say yeah sure uh so i hope people yeah. do that more i i think as at least as an option out of just just humanity out of respect so that you don't feel so reduced to just like guys standing there you know <laughs> <laughs> dog lover <laughs> yeah like, it's like uh you know don't reduce me that far give me some you know Right. humanity um just you know just as a, a matter of respect but um but yes this guy who who you just mentioned who was in you know playing this cardassian the the uh cave cave man the cave dweller <laughs> hey the cave dweller we got to take our our break so we'll talk about uh cave dweller number one on the other side uh very quickly let's give a shout out to melissa longo's website Walking art made by Melissa, tons of good stuff. We'll put that in the comments section below in the description box. And also your sister's website, Abyssinian Kiosk, that we love so much. Uh, guys, make sure you give them some love. We'll put both websites in the description box below uh, because it's really good stuff. And it's people within the family. You know, Melissa's Aaron's wife, uh, Maron is uh, Meron, is a. Uh, yeah. Meron, yes. Sirach's yeah. sister. Not only are they part of the family, but the stuff they make is super quality. It's awesome. Uh, your sister's stuff is so artsy and so cool and so creative. And it's like rich with like cultural history from Eastern Africa, which is so yeah. cool because how much of that do we actually see here? Very little. And it's so rich in history from thousands of years. It's just amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. So please check it Thank out. Thank you very much. Yeah, definitely. We'll send those links and uh, just check it out, guys. And, no and, pressure. Yeah, and we, we appreciate all the support. I mean, it really helps a, a ton when, you know, mm -hmm. our people are ordering and and, um, and liking the merchandise, you know, and liking what they get. So it's, it's, it's a real um, satisfaction. So thank you all for the support. Awesome. All right, we'll see you on the other side on The Seventh Rule.